Welcome to another Sustainability Sunday. Today's topic is mainly going to be hydropower. We're going to talk about the different types of hydropower, how hydropower works in general, uh, the benefits, the downsides, and what the future of hydropower looks like. Uh, but we are going to kick it off with just some environmental and sustainability news uh, from the past couple of weeks. So first piece of news. Greece's entire electrical grid ran on 100% renewables for the first time. Uh, my coworker actually sent me this article because uh, she thought I would think it was interesting. And I, I did. And I still do. So the Greek electrical system, and we talked about Greece a few weeks ago about how Athens is like the most sustainable city in the, in the world for travel. Uh, and the Greek electrical system has hit yet another new milestone running completely on clean renewable energy for the first time. And they did this for about five hours on Friday. Uh, and they reached a peak of 3,100 megawatts of electricity. That's all a lot, right? Five hours. It's not like they ran on fully renewables and they, they did it for 30 minutes in the middle of the night. Uh, they did this for about five hours during the day on Friday, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, Greece does have quite a mix uh, of, of generation for its electricity with nothing accounting for more than 50%, which is really, really cool. Uh, natural gas and renewables are accounting for the most power as of August, 2022, uh, which is, which is pretty, it's, it's like half normal and half pretty great, right? So most places rely on natural gas for the majority of their electricity, but relying on renewables for a lot of it as well is pretty amazing and what's really cool is they have this grease-based nonprofit that really goes into detail about where the energy is coming from so the big the big ones to look at right are renewables which have just been climbing uh the other big ones to look at is lignite which has just been dropping uh, and then fossil gas, which is natural gas, which has kind of been all over the place, unfortunately is on a climb. But with the increase of renewables here, uh, I wouldn't be shocked if we see fossil gas drop for next year uh, with renewables increasing. Um, renewables did surpass fossil gas this year. So renewables covered about 37.5% of the demand with fossil gas uh, covered covering 37.2 so pretty great and it said that that is their uh it's the first time that it's reduced its share um since 2017 so yeah so this is a big one it only dropped by 0.2 percent of the share but the what's impressive here is is the climb of renewables right renewables have only gone up for greece they haven't had a downturn All right so 4.4 5.8 15, 17, 19, 20, 20.5. So the smallest jump, but still 21, 23, 28, 31, 37. So based on this, you know, next year you could see maybe it'll jump to 40, 50%. Probably, probably 40. Um, but that's that's huge. But yeah, so here we go. 2022. Uh, they're really fighting for that 50-50 split. It's not quite there, but it's it's also not that far off. You know, it's 45 55 at this point so pretty great um greece is really setting the standard for what renewable energy should look like we are now going to jump into some more watery news uh and there's two reasons one we're talking about hydropower today so it makes sense to talk about um water and the environment but also it is the 50th anniversary of the clean water act so uh i think it makes sense to talk about clean water, water energy, water in general. Oil spills along the Minnesota River created a tar-like mess that flowed to the Mississippi River and killed an ex estimated 10,000 ducks near Hastings, sparked legislative debate on controlling pollution to protect Minnesota's environment. And then the Cuyahoga River fire, um, massive in terms of uh, environmental legislation. This was a big catalyst. Uh, the Cuyahoga River was severely polluted by chemicals and waste Catching fire in 1969 for the second time. Uh, yeah, and let me let me grab a picture of that. 
This is literally water. Just on fire. And they were they were trying to put it out and like it's already on fire on the water. Clearly it doesn't care about going out. Really, really crazy. Really wild. And this was a catalyst for uh the Environmental Protection Agency and the Clean Water Act. Uh so in 1970, the EPA was established by executive order similarly to how it has been completely stripped of its power. Uh, and then the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and the U.S.-Canada Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement were passed in 1972. One of the biggest years for environmentalism. This period of time is known as the, the golden age of environmentalism. Um, unfortunately, we didn't carry on this momentum uh, like we should have. Uh, so there have been some steps backwards, but you know, still, this was a big, big time. Uh, Minnesota has long been considered a leader in protecting water quality. Prior to the inception of the EPA, the Minnesota State Legislature established their own pollution control agency in 1967 to protect their air, water, and land, building on the efforts of the State Water Pollution Control Commission created in 1945. So Minnesota has, has known about needing to keep their water clean for quite a long time. I know a lot of people don't love regulation, but this is a a, a clear a clear representation of why sometimes reg, uh, regulation is important and, and necessary, right? Um, clearly, people didn't care enough to stop polluting because it would catch rivers on fire. So if you're not going to stop because of this, or if this is what's finally going to make you realize that things need to change, Sometimes somebody needs to step in so that it does not get that bad. Uh, unfortunately, it did get that bad, but, you know, since we've learned, hopefully. However, we still face numerous problems that lack clear solutions. Challenges like forever chemicals, uh, which contaminate groundwater, surface water, and soil. The impacts of intense rainstorms, enduring droughts, wildfires, record high temperatures, all caused by climate change, pose additional challenges. Across America, polls continue to show that people are united in wanting and deserving fresh water to drink, clean air to breathe, and safe places to live and work. Uh, this is why I am basically a single issue voter, and I will pretty much vote for the person that has the strongest environmental policy. Um, it is the most important issue we face, uh, and it is something that we all deserve to have improved, right? There's no reason why we shouldn't improve air quality, water quality, and our ability to continue living. There are still problems with the water, right? So clean water is important, but it's also important to keep an eye on the temperature of the water. Uh, and in the US, heat waves in rivers are on the rise. Why is that a problem? Well, it can cause trouble for fish, plants, and water quality. Uh, obviously, if water gets too warm, it impacts what can live there. Same thing if it gets too cold. Uh, and U.S. rivers are getting into hot water. That is such a tough line for something that really isn't a joke. Uh, like marine heat waves, riverine heat waves occur when water temperatures creep above their typical range for five or more days. I feel like that's a very important distinction, right? It's showing prolonged periods of increased temperature, uh, even just outside of their range. They're not just looking at just the average. Um, it's a range, and it means that it is peaking above that range for five or more days uh, in a row. So that is, is good context here. Um, using 26 years of this geological survey data, researchers compiled daily temperatures for 70 sites in rivers and streams across the U.S. and calculated how many days each site experienced a heat wave per year. From 1996 to 2001, the average annual number of heat waves per day or heat wave days per river climbed from 11 to 25. So in 15 years, no, wow, I can't do math. In 25 years, um, the average number of heat wave days per river climbed and almost doubled. I mean, it more than doubled in 25 years, it more than doubled, um, which might not sound that drastic, but it is, it is. Uh, the study is the first assessment of heat waves and rivers across the country. Uh, and they tallied nearly 4,000 heat wave events, jumping from 82 in 1996 to 198 in 2021, amounting to over 35,000 heat wave days. 
And that's crazy. Again, more than doubling the amount of heat wave events just in 25 years. The researchers found that the frequency of extreme heat increased at sites above reservoirs and in free flowing conditions, but not below reservoirs, possibly because dams release cooler water downstream. That makes sense. So dams. Wow. This is this is going to be an interesting uh, conversation to have um, during the educational portion of our stream. Uh, but. Yeah, so dams could actually be helping to regulate water temperatures downstream, which is interesting. I mean, it doesn't help above it, but still very interesting. Um, most heat waves with temperatures above, uh, with the highest above typical range, though, occurred, out, occurred outside of summer months between December and April. That's really interesting. Um, obviously, human-caused global warming plays a role in these heat waves, uh, but other factors are probably also driving this trend. Less precipitation, lower water volume in rivers means they warm up easier. That's true, but it, that stuff is also impacted by climate change so you know they attempting to dodge a bullet here but really they're not they're just saying the same thing twice uh these very short extreme changes in water temperature can quickly push organisms past their thermal tolerance uh i know that there is a study in um or an article from an uninhabitable earth talking about a species of animal that literally just dropped dead because the bacteria in its body became harmful when the uh the temperature rose by like a tenth of a degree it shows even the little the little impacts are still big you know that's something we all need to think about this research hopefully can be used as a springboard to help mitigate heat waves in the future uh, such as increasing shade cover from trees or managing stormwater there are some um, some states that are requiring stormwater tracking management uh, to be expedited over the next few years in uh, in the U.S. I had to I had an internship where I had to establish a way to track stormwater and uh, in the systems that were being used to channel it. So I had to go like GIS map all of the the culverts and. Um, retention basins and all that uh, across a town in Massachusetts. And it took me like an entire summer. So it is quite a lift to do this stuff, but it is really important. And let's talk about some energy storage, uh, which 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 is an interesting conversation. Energy storage is very important. Um, and hydropower right now is actually a big source of that. Um, so let's talk about water batteries, which could store solar and wind power for when it's needed. The San Diego County Water Authority has an unusual plan to meet the city's scenic San Vicente Reservoir, to use the city's scenic San Vicente Reservoir to store solar power so it's available after sunset. The project, and others like it, could help unlock America's clean energy future. Perhaps a decade from now, if all goes smoothly, large underground pipes will connect this lake to a new reservoir, a much smaller one, built in a nearby canyon about 1,100 feet higher in elevation. When the sun is high in the sky, California's abundant solar power will pump water into that upper reservoir. Uh, so this would use solar power to push the water upwards. So it would be 100% clean energy uh, running this this whole thing. So this would be 8 million tons of water, uh, and operators would be able to open the valve and force those 8 million of tons back downhill through the same pipes, uh, which would drive turbines capable of generating 500 megawatts of electricity for up to eight hours. That's pretty crazy. That's to can power about 130,000 typical homes which would be quite the impact. It's a water battery. Yeah, it is. And and I mean, one thing though is uh, this is really how pumped hydro is used right now. Uh, it is used for water storage and this would be a really good usage of it, especially in California. Solar generation was disappearing uh, and, and power plants couldn't keep up with the demand. Luckily, people stopped using their power and the grid survived. And yeah, earlier on that same day, there was so much solar power available that the grid actually couldn't handle it. They had to turn away more than 2,000 megawatt hours of electricity that solar generators could have delivered, which could have powered a small city. And because there's no option for storage right now there, uh, the energy was truly lost. It was wasted, and there was no way to store it for later when they desperately needed it. So this type of system, especially in a place like California that has a lot of grid struggles, could really 
relieve a lot of the stress on the systems that are currently in place. Uh, yeah, and here we go. This talks about a little bit. The technology that San Diego is proposing, called pumped hydro energy storage, is already operating at more than 40 sites in the U.S. Some of the larger ones can generate more than 1,000 megawatts for up to eight hours. And they were built during the 70s and 80s to store electricity that nuclear power plants generated during the night. And uh, with that, uh, we're actually going to pivot here. We are going to jump into the next part of Sustainability Sunday. <laughs>